you know, it took everything that we had, and many times financially, it got really strapped. And um, there were times when you know you just want to say, man, this isn't working. And so I went to a, a man that had pastored before, and he was his second year Rama student, and I was first year. And I told him, I said, this financially, you know, they're teaching us to tithe and to give, and this isn't working for me. And he came to me with the Bible, and he said, do you believe the Bible? How many of you believe the Bible tonight? He said, do you believe the Bible? And I said, yes, I believe the Bible. And so he took me to Malachi, and I'm not going to have you turn there. But he said this, he said, uh, do you tithe and do you give? And I said, yes. And he said, then what's your problem? And he got up and walked out of the room. And he said, you just need to believe that, Amen. that you tithe and you give. And the Lord said, he'll rebuke the devourer, pour you out a blessing. He'll open the windows of heaven. And he said, you don't have a problem. You've got the faith to stand upon them because you do that. But so tonight, I want to exhort you in this, for those of you that have been giving faithfully and those of you that do tithe, and, uh, sometimes it seems like the seed bin gets dry. Well, you know, then I pray for more seed. But the Lord promises you this. And Haggai, if you want to turn there, you can, but I'm going to uh, just exhort you out of this before we receive the offering. Many times we have to remind ourselves about the Word of God, amen? amen. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, as a matter of fact, I have, I have pledged uh, to donate a certain amount of my income to a particular person. Well, a couple of weeks ago, it got really, really tight, and I was tempted to draw back and say, if I keep that seed, then I'll be able to make the ends meet. And I held on to it for a couple of days, and the Holy Spirit kept telling me, Craig, that's not what you teach, that's not what you believe. You sow this seed like you said you were going to do, and I'll make a way. And I said, all right, I purposed that in my heart. I'm going to get it in the mail. I'm going to go to the bank, and I'm going to get it, and I'm going to mail it out. And you know, before I could even do that, because I purposed it in my heart, God opened a door, and extra money came, and I had it all. And so I want to exhort you in this. And Haggai chapter 1, if you're there, the Lord tells the people this. He sent a prophet to them because they were in a financial bind. And... Verse 5, verse 4, it says, Is it time for you, O you, to dwell in your sealed houses, and my house lays in waste? Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much, and you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's not enough to warm you. And he that earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes in it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go to the mountain, bring wood, and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I'll be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, it, I did blow upon it. Why, says the Lord of hosts? because of my house that is waste, and you run every man into his own house. Therefore the heavens over you are stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. Guys, I don't want to go on to read this, but it would be interesting for you to read that whole chapter and the whole book of Haggai, because the, it's, it's contrary to the way that we think. We think when the economy's tough and the jobs are tight and we're not getting overtime and they're threatening layoff, I better hang on to it. But God says, if you consider my ways and you go my way, I'll make a way for you. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't, you don't know how it's going to work out, but God said he'll make a way. And, and I've been in that situation. And as a matter of fact, Pastor Dorothy and I bought our first house when we moved here to Mustang, bought and sold, uh, closed the deal on Monday. I, went, I was working another job besides the pastorate. I went to work, and they, at 11 o'clock they called me. And I was up on the ladder doing the work, doing the construction. They called me and they handed me the paycheck for the week. And in that paycheck was a pink slip. They said, don't pick up your equipment. Just leave it lay and get out of the building. They wanted to make sure, that, you know, people don't like to get laid off. And there, I just bought a house the day before and now I don't have a job. 
Well, you know what? God made a way. Glory to God. And he always does. Amen. So I just want to encourage you that if you've been sowing seed and you've been tithing and you've been giving, guys, and it seems like it's tight, God said he'll make a way. And this is the word that you can stand on right here. And somebody said, you really believe that, Craig? I said, yes, I do. Because if that doesn't work, then how do I know if John 3, 16 works? That's right. How do I know that resurrection power works? This all has to work for me. If this all doesn't work, then I don't know what part of it to choose and pick from. So guys, I just want to encourage you. You keep staying strong. Don't back up and don't quit. Amen. Ushers, come on. The envelopes are there in front of you. You keep doing what you're knowing to do. Glory to God. And we're going to... Okay, stand with me, everybody. We're going to pray before they receive the offering. What? No, let's pray. You all right? You bet. Lift your offering up, everybody. Father, we just stand upon Haggai, the word of the Lord that comes to us and says, Lord, as long as we prepare your house, hallelujah, that when we sow our seed, we're going to reap bountifully. And Lord, you said that if we tithe and if we give, that you would open the windows of heaven, pour us out a blessing that we wouldn't have room enough to receive it, and you would rebuke the devourer. That means our refrigerators are going to last longer, our washers are going to last longer, our cars are going to last longer, our clothes are going to last longer, and Father, you're going to bless us according to your word. And everybody that believes it, say amen. 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 Glory to God. Go ahead and receive the offer. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory, glory, glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory. Are you expecting tonight? Hallelujah. I got to tell you, this afternoon I was... Uh, in my room and I was studying and uh, I was preparing for tonight and I dozed off into a, 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 a sleep and I was, you know, uh, and all of a sudden uh, the Holy Ghost woke me up and I was just full of anticipation. Uh, uh, something exciting is happening tonight. Praise God. So get ready. Amen. Well, while you're standing, why don't you grab your Bible, lift your Bible with me and say this out loud. This is my Bible. I have what it says I can have. I do what it says I can do. I am what it says I am. Father, in the name of Jesus, I am about to receive the incorruptible, the indestructible, the ever-living, the ever-producing seed of the living God. Father, I confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My body is awake. From this moment forward, I will never be the same. I'll never, never, never. I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory to God. Well, you may be seated, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, on Wednesdays, uh, when I've been sharing... Uh, We've been talking about God's health care plan. God has a plan concerning our health. Amen? I'm not going to do a lot of review tonight because the lesson is a little bit uh, lengthy, so I've got to get after it. I've got about a half hour to get a two-hour message done so we don't wear Vicky out back here in the children's department. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. We'll begin reading in verse 5. This tonight... Uh, is an important message. This is a message that if we are going to receive from God, oh, Pam, I forgot to pray over that clock. Does he need to go back to class or something? You want to take him back here? Do I need to pray over him? All right, let's, let's pray over him. Just leave him there. I'll leave him right there. Pastor Dorothy's out, so we're going to pray over this, these blankets. and stuff. The Bible says there's an impartation through touch the cloth, and so we're going to pray for him. And we're going to pray for these cloths so that the, when they touch him, he'll be healed. Amen? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the anointing that is upon this cloth, Father God. And I speak to this sickness and disease that's in his body, that it would loose him and let him go. And he's healed because Jesus carried sickness and disease. And by the stripes that Jesus has taken upon his body, this child is healed from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. He might be more comfortable back there in one of the beds or something. Praise God. Well, he's a healed man. Amen. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 12, he's feeling better already. Hebrew, <laughs> now he's ready to run and shout. Uh, concerning God's health care plan, we have to deal with this issue tonight because of tradition, 
because of misinterpretation, because of preachers that have preached out of the flesh rather than out of the Word of God. And so I've, we've already established this in the weeks past that God's Word is final authority. Are we in agreement with that? That no matter what my thoughts are, no matter what my tradition has taught me or what people have said, I need to go with the Word of God and change my thinking and my beliefs to what the Word of God says. And then we're on a good foundation. We're on the foundation that will not crumble when the test and the trials come. So let's go with the Word of God tonight. Take, take off your religious cap, if you will. Put on the spirit of, of I'm going to learn, I'm going to be open, I'm going to receive by the power of God. Amen? All right, so be, be, uh, be teachable. Uh, I'm not trying to make anybody mad. I'm not trying to get, come against your church background or where you're coming from. I just want to go with the Word of God. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, uh, it says, and this is the King James Version, and it's on the board behind me if you don't have a King James Bible. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. How many of you are born again? A couple of hands. Well, we need to have a salvation call, right? All right. If you're born again, then you're a child of God. You belong to God. All right? He says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastening, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us, after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So we can readily see in this scripture that because we're children of God, God does correct us. Uh, that word chastening, we're going to define it a little bit later, but I just want to interject this right now. That word chastening means to child train us. Child train us. But the key that I want to show you here is verse 9. It says in that B part that we should be subjected unto the Father of spirits. God is a spirit. He's not a natural man. Understand that. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12 reiterating the same thing, it says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrects, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. So tonight, I want to talk to you about God's correction. How does God correct us? How does he child train us? How does he discipline us? And Let's look at it in this light. We're talking about God's healing power, God's health care plan. So specifically, I want to zero in on this. Does God use sickness, calamity, or evil to teach us and lead us the way he wants us to go? Let's talk about that. Number one, we are his children. Let's establish that in Ephesians chapter 6. Let's look at verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As natural fathers, uh, we're not supposed to provoke our children to wrath. If we do, uh, they could end up uh, filled with wrath themselves. They could end up hating us and getting off on the deep end, right? If we punish them too harshly. But we are supposed to train them. We are supposed to uh, discipline them. Amen? He admonishes us, or he tells us that word admonition means we're supposed to warn our children or reprove them 
or, and nurture them. Amen? I mean, in the natural realm, I'll never forget, Pastor Dorothy and I, uh, uh, after five years, Pastor Jason was born, and I'll never forget, she used to have a little tub uh, that she would bathe him in, and she would put it on the counter. And back in those days, we, we lived in a mobile home, but they did not have GFIs or ground fault interrupters or interceptors. And so while he was laying there and she was bathing him, he was real curious and he kept trying to stick his finger in that light socket. Well, and she would tap his finger and say, no, 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 no. She wouldn't slap him with a ruler or, or you know, draw his blood, but she would just tap him. No, 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 no. And it was months and he'd still try to do it. No, no. And then finally it got to the point where he wasn't reaching for that plug anymore. But now think about this. In the natural realm, what parent would have just said, well, I hope if he gets contact, I hope he lives through it. No, we're going to correct him for his own good so that he doesn't get killed. He doesn't understand electricity. As a matter of fact, Pastor Dorothy didn't understand it either, but she knows if you stick something in there wrongly, you're going to have results, right? So she corrected him. She trained him not to stick something in that outlet, especially your finger, a wet finger, amen? So we do want to train them, so we're going to warn them or reprove them and admonish them. Now that word chasten, again, uh, says we are his children, and as natural parent, uh, we train up our children, so does our heavenly father, amen? amen. Uh, so, but our heavenly father, does he use the same methods? That's what we want to talk about tonight, Amen. One commentator that I read after studying this scripture said this, and that's why you have to be cautious, and Brother Hagin always taught us this. When you listen to ministers, even, you know, listening to me, you know, if you don't agree with something, look it up in the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, then, you know, throw it out. I'm not 100% right, but, you know, uh, are you right most of the time, Pastor? Yeah, I can wait for, to get to heaven for you to find out I was right, but in that if I say something and it's not scriptural, then just throw it out. Amen? And so Brother Hagin always said this, eat the hay and spit out the sticks. Eat the hay and spit out the sticks. When he, he was going to a Baptist church, um, they, they were preaching about salvation and he was raised Baptist, but then he needed healing and he got involved with full gospel people and they believed in healing. But he said when he went there, they were speaking in other tongues, and he thought, well, that's fanaticism. I can put up with that because they believe in healing and I need help. And so then he found out that they were right about other tongues and, and the Holy Ghost. So you know what? You may not always think it sounds right, and it may be uh, something contrary to what you've heard in the past, but just put it on the shelf, and you might find out later that uh, you need to change your theology. Amen? But this one commentator said this, he said, a natural father may spank a child, and so the Lord spanks us. And he was reading that in the book of Hebrews. He said, natural parents spank, so God spanks. And he said this, he denoted the fact that God may correct us using fleshy means, like sickness and disease, amen? But I think we need to be safe and go with what the Bible says, don't you? Amen. Now, understand this. In the Old Testament, you can read in the Old Testament, and it appears that God put disease and sickness and calamity on people to teach them things. But if you, and people often use the, uh, the book of Exodus when Moses was trying to get the people of Israel out of Egypt. And, and the, remember all those plagues that came on Pharaoh? But God didn't cause that. God didn't do that. Pharaoh did that. And actually, Every plague, if you study it, came against one of their false gods. Every one of those plagues, the flies, the fleas, the blood, the river Nile, the whole thing. Every time Pharaoh denied letting God's people go, letting his firstborn, and that was the statement, let my firstborn go free. Why did Pharaoh's son die? That was his firstborn. He would not, Pharaoh would not let God's firstborn come out of Egypt, therefore he brought the curse on his own son. But in the Old Testament, they didn't know there was a devil. They believed that everything good and everything bad came from God. But thank God Jesus came and he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. He came to reveal to us that God is a good God. Amen. All right, look at this. Some of man's ideas of the way that God corrects us and leads us is that God puts sickness on us to teach us something or God kills our family members to, to get us on track, or, 
or, or because we've sinned, a family member gets sick or we lose our jobs or God's doing that to correct us because we've messed it up, right? Well, we get in car accidents and we break our legs and children die because God's trying to teach us something. Guys, listen, that's not our God. That's just man's thinking. That's man trying to justify the calamity that happens in this world. But that's not our God. Amen? Some may, might even say that God, now listen to this one. Some might even say if you ever have lost a, a, a brother or a sister or a young child or if you've ever gone to a funeral of a child, you'll hear preachers preach this, that well, they, God loved that child so much that he wanted to take that little one home and give him wings, you know. That's crazy talk. I don't know how that comforts an adult, but for some reason these preachers think it does. Uh, that just makes me angry because God doesn't kill babies and take them home. And, and Pastor Dorothy's brother got killed when he was uh, 17 years old, and the preacher stood up, and he actually counseled with the family. We all went into a room, and Pastor counseled us. He said, you know, are, are you all, you all want to make any comments or anything like that? And Dorothy's brother was... Um, he was in music. He was a musician. He was Mr. Music Man himself. He could play any instrument, uh, and, and he was, had a rock and roll band, and he played at weddings and things like that. And so the preacher actually said this. He said, God knew the direction he was going, and because he was getting into rock and roll music, he knew where that was leading, and to protect him from the, from the sin that he was headed in, God killed him and took him home. Y'all want to know, I studied the Greek on that. You want to know what the Greek translation is of that? <laughs> That's ridiculous. You know what that said to me? That God loved Donnie so much that he took him home to protect him from sin, but he didn't love me as much because I'm still here. That's what it said to me. And that's crazy talk. That's not God. Let's look at it some more, all right? Are y'all with me? All right. Let's use the scripture to examine these statements, all right? So we always need to use the Word of God. Scripture will back up Scripture. Amen? All right. God does child train us. We read that, all right? Now watch this. If God uses sickness to train us as His children, then when you first got saved, God should have made you sick right away to start training you. He wants to start teaching you, so right away you need to get sick as soon as you get born again. Does that make sense to your mind? No, that's not our God. Amen? All right, listen to this. Think about this statement. Think about what this embraces. If God puts sickness on his children to teach them something, then only God's people would be sick. People in the world wouldn't be sick. Let's see, when I was in the world, God wasn't correcting me. He wasn't teaching me anything. Now that I'm his child, he's going to make me sick to teach me something. So it's only his children that get sick. Worldly people don't get sick. That's, no, listen, you can't have it both ways. Either God makes you sick or God heals you. Which is it? Because the, look, turn to this scripture real quickly, Mark chapter 3, verse 24. You cannot have it both ways. If God puts sickness on you and then he heals you, his kingdom is divided. And a kingdom divided, well, let's just read it. A kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. So if God puts sickness on you and then he heals you, he's dividing his kingdom and his kingdom won't stand. But how many of you know God's kingdom will last forever? So we can't have it both ways. Which way is it? Either God is the one that puts sickness on you or he's the healer. Which way is it? Talk to me, church. Come on. See, the healer or the... Think about this. I don't know why when people uh, get upset or let's just use a, a, a contractor, for example, because I, I was a contract. Uh, if you hit your thumb with a hammer, why would somebody set, use God's name and say he's the dammer? God's not the dammer. Really, when you think about it, the devil is the dammer. So if I hit my thumb with the hammer, I should say, devil damn. Am I right? Did you ever hit your thumb, brother? 
So the devil wants us to think that God is the dammer. No, God didn't hit my thumb with the hammer. I did. I need to learn what the real head of that nail is like, not my thumb. Amen. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. It says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of the flesh which correct us, and we gave them reverence that we not much rather, uh, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So our natural fathers use natural means to correct us. Amen? But God is the Father of spirits. So he would use spiritual means to train us. Are you with me? All right, turn to John chapter 4. Let's look at verse 24. Let's back it up with Scripture. Let's not just use my theology. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Look at John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Glory to God. So now watch this. Would you consider sickness and disease and calamity to be evil or good? Amen. You would think that a first grader could get this. I mean, if I hit my thumb, is that good or bad? That's bad. That's not good. Oh, and it, oh, thank God I hit my thumb. Oh, God's trying to teach me something. He's trying to teach you to keep your thumb out of the way and use air, air nailers. <laughs> Glory to God. Back when I used to fr start framing when I was 20 years old, we had to use hand nails and all that. And then we, now we got the air nailers. Hello. Can you imagine God using an air nailer to teach you something? Bam. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, I was trying to teach Pastor Dorothy last week. I was building a shed, and I said, honey, I need your help. I'm going to hold this piece of plywood up, and I'm going to show you. I showed her on a piece of wood first. I said, now this has got 120 pounds of pressure, and it shoots a, a 16 common nail. I said, so when you shoot it, hit it and sh pull the trigger and shoot it. And I forgot to tell her it kicks. So she went and pulled the trigger and went bam, and she hit it and it went bam, bam. I said, oh, I forgot to tell you it kicks. She said, yeah. I said, well, I'm glad I showed you on a, on a, on a trial piece before I held, now I'm going to hold this plywood up, and when, it, when you shoot it, don't let it kick and shoot my hand. And after she shot it, she did really good. She went bam, 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 bam. And I said, whoa, you did good. You, did, you got an automatic there. And I told her, I said, you know, the, uh, there was a guy back when I worked at the City of Faith who was training his wife to use one of those air nailers, and they, he was framing a house, and he held the plywood up. He forgot to tell her it kicked. And she went, bam, and it kicked, and it shot him in the back of the head with one of those 16 common nails. He walked into the emergency room holding his head. They put him in the ER, did the surgery, pulled the nail out, and he walked back out of the hospital. Didn't touch anything. I wonder if he touched her later. I don't know. Uh, it was his fault for not teaching her that it kicks, right? Hallelujah. I had a guy, I, had a guy, I was really good. With, are you, were you good with one of those nailers, brother? I could shoot across the room and hit a pop can with one of those. I, I, I was having a guy help me frame this platform in, and I told him, I said, you got to be careful with these nailers. That, those guns are heavy, aren't they, brother? I said, you got to be careful with that. I said, but if you get good with it, I said, you can shoot across the room and hit targets with that. He said, no, you can't. I said, well, put that pop can up back there and watch me hit it. Bam, and I stuck that in that pop can back there. I said, see, you can get that good with that thing. All right, anyway, those rabbit trails are... So you all need to go buy air nailers and practice, right? So sickness and disease, we can all agree that it's bad, right? Amen. All right, look at John 10, 10. Jesus is trying to tell us, hallelujah. Oh, pastor's preaching about air guns in church, right? John 10, 10. <laughs> the thief, who's the thief in the word of God? The devil. Say it out loud. The devil is the thief. But he comes for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So it's not hard to, you know, put your balance sheet out there. It's very simple. Is what happened to me today good or bad? Is this abundant life or is it something that's trying to steal from me? If it's trying to steal from you, then it's not from God. It goes over on the negative balance side of the balance sheet. But if it's good then it comes from God. 
Hallelujah. There was one preacher years ago back in the early 20th century. They had tent revivals back then. How many of you remember those days back in the 40s? You ever see tent revivals? You don't remember if some of you aren't that old, but they had tent revivals. And there was a pastor that had a, a, a big tent, held thousands of people, and a tornado came through Texas and blew the tent down. Tore it up. They didn't have insurance because nobody would insure tents back in those days, and they probably still won't. And he stood up in front of the congregation, and he said, well, let's pray tonight. I don't know whether it was God that blew the tent down or the devil. Guy, you don't need to be preaching. God's not in the business of tearing down gospel tents. He's in the business of putting them up. I mean, how silly can you be? Amen. And we hear these things and people embrace them and they put them down as doctrine and then you don't know. Tornado comes through Oklahoma, rips up a family's house. You, well, I, maybe it was God trying to teach them something. No, guys, it wasn't God. God's earthquake set people free. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 12. Y'all getting anything? Say, God is a good God. Now, you see, we can say that freely today because of Oral Roberts back in the 50s. You know, he got persecuted for that. Persecuted strongly. People wrote him all kinds of letters. How dare you say God is a good God? And he used to say, there's something good going to happen to you today. And, and people got mad about that. What do you want me to say? Well, something bad going to happen to you today. Oh, yeah, we, we believe it. Yeah, we, we believe it. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man. Blessed or happy and to be envied is the man that endures temptation. Now, let, let, let's clarify that a little bit. That word temptation is interesting. It, that word temptation is translated test and trials. So we could read it like this. Happy and to be envied is the man that endures temptations, tests, and trials. Amen. For when he is tempted, tested, and tried, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man... Now watch this. Get verse 13 and highlight this and star it in your Bible. Let no man say when he's tempted, tested, or tried that I'm tempted, tested, and tried of God. For God cannot be tempted, tested, or tried with evil. Neither tempteth, testeth, or tries he any man. That settles it right there. Now, whether we understand the test or the trial or not, we, we don't. And I've heard people preach this. How many, how many of you ladies have diamonds? Anybody have diamonds on your fingers? No, some of you are ashamed to put them up. God, if you got a guy, man, bless, wave that thing around. God blessed you with, <laughs> look at, I got all these, I got 12 or 13 diamonds, bless God. But I've heard a preacher say this, well, you know, God puts pressure on you to perfect you. After all, that diamond was just a hunk of coal under pressure for millions of years. And so you're under pressure so God can get you to be a gem. You've heard that. It's junk. It's junk. What does the book of Hebrews say? Let no man say when he's tempted, tested, or tried that he's tempted, and tested, and tried of God. That pressure was put on you to squeeze you, to get you to doubt God, and fold up and quit. And it was sent by the devil right from the pit of hell. I know I'm making a lot of people mad tonight that are watching live, but... Hallelujah. Let's look at verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In other words, God never changes. He doesn't just try to put some evil on you just to see if it's going to work. God is not testing your faith. He knows your faith works. He doesn't have to test it. <clears throat> Are you listening? God does not tempt you with evil. Amen. Now listen, no matter what package it comes in or how it might be disguised, sickness and calamity and evil comes from the devil. Amen. One of the very first big revivals that I was in was a full gospel preacher. We were still going to a traditional church at that time, and I ended up in this full gospel um, uh, revival, and, the, and, and I, I, I didn't even read the word that much. I was just getting into it, and this preacher stood up, and he preached about how he got turned to the Lord. He was walking through the cornfield one day, 
and he was taking care of the farm, and he said, I heard this voice speak to me and say, when are you going to go into the ministry like I've called you? If you don't obey me and go into the ministry, I'm going to kill your little brother. And he said, I went into the ministry right away, and God got me where he wanted me to be. I turned to my wife and I said, that's crazy talk. God doesn't have to kill his brother to get him into the ministry. God sacrificed Jesus and he was the last sacrifice. Amen. I said, that's crazy talk. And so I spit that stick out. And he sang his songs, preached his message. People got saved. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Amen. So God does not put sickness on us to lead us into salvation. Amen? Now God can use it. God can use it when tragedy comes and problems come. I've been at funerals and I've preached funerals where people have come up and said, I changed my life after you preached that message. But God didn't kill that person in that casket to get them to salvation. I and then we switched and we went to a full gospel church. And the pastor, I love the pastor, uh, he's been here and preached, but he preached a lot of things that weren't right. And, and I loved him, and, and, and he stood up and he preached this. He said, when he was uh, in his 40s, I guess, he got pneumonia, went into the hospital. While he was in the hospital, he led the person in the bed next to them, or next to him, he led him to the Lord, got him saved. And he stood up, he was all excited. When he got out of the hospital, he came back and he preached this. He said, well, God put pneumonia on me and sent me to the hospital so I can lead that person to the Lord. Oh, I wanted to bite my Bible. I want to say, no, if you'd have just listened to the Holy Ghost, he could have sent you to the hospital without the pneumonia. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you got to remember, he tried to keep me from going into the ministry that I'm in. He tried to get me to go to his Bible college instead of where we went because he didn't want me to get in that faith message. Well, I'm a faith person, glory to God. Bone to bone, I'm a faith man. I'm going to dance with the one that brung me out, amen? Romans chapter 2, verse 4, and we've got to start closing this down, guys, because Vicky is uh, very patient back there. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Hallelujah. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads people to repentance? The goodness of God leads us to repentance. Amen. So how does God child train us? Let's go very quickly and we'll close. I got about four minutes here. If you turn the clock back, I'll have another 10. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Let's, again, go to the Bible. Now, Pastor, you said God trains us, but you said he doesn't put sickness, disease, and problems on us to train us. So how does he do it? Well, I'm glad you asked. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Remember, God's a spirit. Remember, his words are spirit and their life. All scripture, you there? All, everybody say all scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. You know in the Old Testament where he tells us in Proverbs not to spare the rod? The rod is reference to the word of God. So don't spare your children the word of God. If they get off track, they may not like it. We've had to preach to our children that, you know, this is what the word of God says. And you're headed in this direction, and that's not what the Bible teaches. They didn't like it. Because why? All our friends are doing it. No, all your friends might be going to hell too. And we're not going to let you go to hell. This is what the Bible says. And so they changed. It wasn't comfortable. It was a correction. Amen. All Scripture. Everybody say all Scripture. You see, it's given for your doctrine. So build your doctrine upon the Word of God. Rightly divide it. Amen. You see, I can stand up here and put Scripture together and convince you to do anything if I don't rightly divide it. How many of you know the scripture where it says Judas went out and hung himself? How many of you have read that? Anybody? A couple of you people do read the Bible. You remember that? 
Well, there's another scripture that says, go ye and do likewise. <laughs> Hello? Well, we know that's not rightly dividing the word of God. God doesn't want you to go out and hang yourself. Psalm chapter 94, verse 12. We laugh at some of these things, but guys, uh, you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. I, I don't have time to tell you some of these other stories. Psalm 94, verse 12 says, Blessed or happy and to be envied is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teachest him out of his what? Out of the law or out of the word of God. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, going very quickly now, says that he might sanctify and cleanse it or cleanse you with the washing of water by the word. So the word of God's going to clean us up. If we allow it to, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, The word of God is alive or quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So when we get into the word of God, the word of God will tell us if it's flesh or if it's spirit, if we're doing right or if we're doing wrong. And then we need to listen to that. Amen. All right, we're going a little bit long here. I'm not going to read this next scripture. I'm going to jump right down and let's summarize this. Amen. How many of you are God's children? Wave at me. That's everybody in here. All right. Hallelujah. How many of you learned tonight that that, that word chasten means to child train us? Amen. Some of you learned that tonight. How many of you learned this, that all good things come from God? Wave two hands at me. Amen. How many of you believe that sickness is evil? Amen. So you are listening, right? God trains us. How? Let's, you answer. By the word of God. Amen. Listen to this. John 6, 63. This is the last scripture. I skipped a couple. It is the spirit that quickeneth or makes it alive. The flesh profits nothing. Watch this. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are what? Life. So God uses his word to train us. Stand on your feet, everybody. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So the next time somebody you're talking to says, well, God put this sickness on me to teach me something, turn to them and say, don't cuss about my father like that. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. Did y'all get anything out of this tonight? Praise the Lord. Father, we're so thankful for your word. Hallelujah. We're going to continue this teaching next Wednesday. And glory to God. Uh, when we get over into uh, the, maybe this next lesson, we're going to lay hands on you. We're going to pray with you if you need healing. And we're going to teach you how to keep it once you get it. Amen. Y'all enjoying this? Yeah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you tonight. We give you the glory and the praise. Everybody lift your hands and say, I got it. I got it. I got it. Now I want you to sing this song with me. There ain't no bugs on me. Ain't no bugs on me. There might be bugs on some of you mugs, but there ain't no bugs on me. Give God glory now. Hallelujah. <laughs> I love you guys and you're dismissed. Amen.